sometimes with your noodles, you need a little bit of protein. And who can say no to that? Trout and noodles. Bring it on. Never take any more than what you need. So that's the perfect size for this pot. I've only got one pot and it's perfect for me. So we're gonna boil him up with the noodles and trout noodles it is tonight. Or late this afternoon, should I say. Have a fun day. Enjoy the cooking lesson. Okay, what other tips can I give you for fly tying? Uh, the other tips are... Apart from the good hooks. Can't recommend that again enough. Especially the small ones. The larger ones, you can get away with some cheap stuff. Uh, thread. I'm heavy-handed when I'm tying. And I'm always breaking the thread. And then i got to restart. And, you know, and it's just... I swear a lot. But I stopped swearing a lot when I started to use a lot of flat waxed, mainly salt water thread, especially when I'm tying foam, etc. Uh, it's just a lot stronger. And if you've got thread sitting in the sun, it deteriorates and it snaps really easy. So if you've got old thread, just bin it, buy yourself some new thread. Young kid, I used all these ones given to me, hen hackles, and my flies just didn't look as good as the short ones or, or other people's and I could never figure it out. But I couldn't afford these expensive feathers that I would see and go, how much for that? Oh, I'm not buying that. And it went on and on like that. Eventually, I think somebody gave me a couple and I tied some flies and went, holy crap, it just transformed my dry flies nice little stiff hackles so those big long feathers you'll get more flies out of one of them than what you will 20 crap ones so it's worth the money that's my tips for today i'm gonna love you and leave you thank you for watching thanks for your support and uh just get out there and have fun and have you know fishermen usually like insects nature you know um but anyway, so what it's saying in here is da -da 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 -da. in the northern reaches of the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes area in the past, there were so many mayflies when they hatched. There were so many. They reckoned some, sometimes there was 80 billion in the air, a massive cloud of them. And it was showing up on the weather radar, a big black mass. That's how many. I'd love to see it because um, I'm geeky like that. But anyway, that's what was there, right? Uh, in 2012. But since 2012, not that long ago, they've, they've realized there's a slump in the population of mayflies. 50%. 50% of the mayflies have gone. Already gone in that short period. Decline is likely a result of water pollution. Wow. Uh, America needs to be doing something about that because that is a worry because you need all the mayflies, you need all the insects. It's a big knock-on effect. But in here, and it's about Britain, and I was like, oh my God, United Kingdom, Britain, is going to be terrible. But it's not. It's not perfect. Nothing's ever perfect, but it says here, Freshwater, um, da -da 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 -da. yeah, freshwater insects in the United Kingdom have actually increased over the past fifty years, thanks to clean water reg regulations in the country. So it shows you it can be done. We've got to try and look after the insects, which help us look after the planet. There you go. Just a little bit of stew waffle for you. Um. Hope you found that interesting because people are asking me what got me into fly tying. Well, I started as a kid, you know, and and I started tying the flies and then the fly design started straight away, basically. I couldn't help myself. You know, I tied some traditional Scottish flies and then gradually 
it just all started. I started using plastics, synthetics, you know, mucking around even as a kid. And, and then years later, I had this vision to try and create a job, well, profession. And I approached a few f massive fly companies and says, will you hire me as a fly designer and pay me a salary? They all said no. <laughs> but uh, Dennis Black from Umco, the first guy that started a royalty tire scheme in America, um, he moved to New Zealand and set up Umco in New Zealand. And eventually through the years, uh, I had contact with him. Untold hours once, um, especially one winter, just locked up, time flies. So much so, I started getting headaches. And I went to an eye specialist and they said it was just eye strain. But he took up 17 of my designs, which was just an honor. He normally only takes up one or two from a different fly tire. But I realized he did these designs and that was, you know, just such an honor. I was so wrapped. You get your name in them, but I wasn't getting, you hardly get anything for it. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, the companies, they succeed. And then I approached another company in America, the fourth biggest one, they're massive. And I went overseas and I showed them how to tie so many of my fly designs, I can't remember how many, but it was over a dozen or something. And I became a royalty to tire for them. And, and that was fantastic again, but not, but not. Because, um, they charged me quite a bit for the flags when I bought them. And then when I tried to onward sell them and use them, I realized the hooks they use were crap. Okay for catching American smaller trout, etc. But in New Zealand, they were just breaking off, even catching on the trees and pulling them back. They were straightening, snapping. And uh, so I had a problem, um, but it was an honor becoming the first person outside of America to become a royalty tire for an American company. I didn't realize that at the time until somebody told me and then I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. But again, no money. So, and you need money to survive. And so I just, I'd, I'd done all the work and I, you know, I didn't want to become just somebody with my name in front of a flyer for a big company. They make the money, I get nothing. A few people were asking me what got me into fly time. Well, I started as a kid, you know, and, and I started tying the flies and then fly design started straight away basically. I couldn't help myself. You know, I tied some traditional Scottish flies and then gradually it just all started. I started using plastic synthetics, you know, mucking around even as a kid. And and then years later I had this vision to try and create a job well profession. And I approached a few massive fly companies and says Will you hire me as a fly designer and pay me a salary? They all said no. <laughs> but uh, Dennis Black from Umco, the first guy that started a royalty tire scheme in America, um, he moved to New Zealand and set up Umco in New Zealand. And eventually through the years, uh, I had contact with him and I spent untold hours once um, especially one winter just locked up time flies so much so I started getting headaches and I went to an eye specialist and they said it was just eye strain but he took up 17 of my designs which was just an honor he normally only takes up one or two from a different fly tire but I realized he did these designs and that was you know just such an honor I was so wrapped you get your name in them but I wasn't getting you hardly get anything for it, you know. I mean, at the end of the day, the companies, they succeed. And then I approached another company in America, the fourth biggest one, they're massive. And I went overseas and I showed them how to tie so many of my fly designs, I can't remember how many, but it was over a dozen or something. And I became a royalty to tire for them. And, and that was fantastic again, but not because um, they charged me quite a bit for the flags when I bought them. And then when I tried to onward sell them and use them, I realized the hooks they use were crap. Okay for 
catching American smaller trout, etc. But in New Zealand, they were just breaking off, even catching on the trees and pulling them back. They were straightening, snapping. And uh, so I had a problem. Um, but it was an honour becoming the first person outside of America to become a royalty tire for an American company. I didn't realise that, that at the time until somebody told me and then I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. But again, no money. So, and you need money to survive. And so I just, I'd, I'd done all the work and I, you know, I didn't want to be come just somebody with my name in front of a flyer for a big company they make the money I get nothing so a bit like music I suppose and so I then um went out on my own basically that's what started me so that's that's the answer that's how it all started you know just just sheer hard work and decades of just trial and error is the only way that's the bit nobody sees. They just think, well, yeah, boom. It just happens. Nothing just happens. I realise that in life. Like me being here in this little Mattel unit, trying to write this book. It just doesn't happen. I've got to force myself to do it, to be successful. And, or have a crack at it anyway. But anyway, I love you and leave you from Tasmania. Thanks for watching and thanks for your support. You rock. I need that support. That's what keeps the thing alive. The mojo. So I then um, went out on my own. Basically that's what started me. So that's, that's the answer. That's how it all started, you know. Just, just sheer hard work and decades of just trial and error. It's the only way. That's the bit nobody sees. They just think, well, yeah, boom. It just happens. Nothing just happens. I realise that in life. Like me being here in this little Mattel unit, trying to write this book. It just doesn't happen. I've got to force myself to do it, to be successful. And, or have a crack at it anyway. But anyway, I love you and leave you from Tasmania. Thanks for watching and thanks for your support. You rock. I need that support. That's what keeps the thing alive. The mojo. Good morning. I am still in Tasmania. I've just got this little funky, found this little funky uh, hotel. It's got all these neat little things outside. It's just so quirky. I've never been in anywhere like it. And it's reasonably priced. But um, I've holed up here for probably maybe nearly two weeks. It's just been getting extended, extended, because I'm busy working on um, Wandering Trout. I'm trying to finish off the last couple of chapters, and I visited a few museums, etc., which are some way connected to fishing that will be uh, in, the, in the book, hopefully, unless the editor says, no, they're crap, Stu. And then I need to nuke my little darlings, as Ben says. But the amazing thing is I've got this room and one of the museums I went to is this place here. It's called the Salmon Ponds and there's a trout museum, etc. there. Uh, just got a couple of copies of these been sent to me from New Zealand. Out come the dogs. And I'm going to give these to two people that's helped me a lot over here. Uh, legends, inspiration. So... Yeah, this book here. And in this book, interestingly enough, in this book, there's this fly here. It's called the Da Bomb, right? It's a mayfly imitation. And it sinks like a brick. It's got a tungsten bead laid inside it. It's not called the Bomb. I called it Da Bomb. I kind of neat when people are the 12 bombs and they say, I've I send 12 bombs through the post, you know, I kind of like humour myself, but it lands in the water, especially the big one, big splash, and sinks like a brick. So it sort of lands and explodes like a bomb, hence the name. It's the heaviest fly I do, and I do it in grey as well. It comes in all different sizes, from tiny size 18 to size 6. But in this book here, I've realised, like all, all my books, 
it's little snippets of information of where these flies originated from. And um, I designed that fly when on a, tr on a trip to the Himalayas. And it's in this book where I use yak fur and a vulture or eagle feather, I can't remember. And I didn't have my vice with me. I made a point of not taking my vice, but taking some fly time material. And I used my hands old school like I did when I was a kid. I worked on the design with just the basics. And that's what I wanted to do. I went there without all the fancy gear. And I wanted to just have nothing and just be, a, you know, design this fly organically. And it happened. And that's the fly there. Whoop. Alan from Sydney's asking me on this trip, do I have my vice with me? And uh, normally for years, for absolutely years when I've been traveling, I've always got my vice with me and I got fly time material, etc. This time I don't have any with me. I just wasn't in the frame of mind for, for designing flies, but I'm always thinking about them. But there is a few that um, I'm keen to, to work on. I've just got to get my head in the right space and create time to do it. But I'm concentrating at the moment on trying to obviously write some books, etc. All, all, all connected to fly fishing, fishing, fly time. A couple of times I've went, oh, if I had my vice, I could just, I just want to do something. I want to work on something. But I, I know that I need to keep focused on the job at hand, which is getting this story for you guys to have some fun and read. So when I was in the Big Horn River, um, up at Fort Smith, years ago, I was fishing for carp. Did a bit of trout fishing. But there was heaps of scuds, heaps of freshwater shrimps in the water. And so I decided to bring out my own range of scuds. And I've got brown ones, pink ones, white ones. I've got ones that glow in the dark, which is quite unusual. Um, and pretty effective. This is them there, hopefully you can see it. It's a little shrimp. You know, unless you've got an allergy to seafood, who doesn't like a bit of shrimp? So there you go. There's some little shrimps. Got really small ones, size 16s, and I got size 12s. If you need any little shrimps, freshwater shrimps, this is the go. You get them from me, right? <laughs> no, but um, yeah, no, buy them from me. Help support the artist. And the other great thing is when I was at Fort Smith, quick one, they, um, I just missed a carp tournament, damn. But a lovely fly shop there gave me a drift boat to go and row around, uh, I think it was called the Yellow Lake or something up there. And it was brilliant. They gave me the boat, they left me for the day. I went out in the middle and the wind got up and I realized I hadn't rowed a boat for years and I was hopeless and I was panicking. And eventually I got back at the end of the day, says, how was it? And I says, oh, it was brilliant. I didn't tell him the truth. I was petrified. I couldn't get the boat back. <laughs> anyway, love you and leave you. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your support. You people have asked, do you have any worm flies? Worm, worm, worm. It's my Scottish accent, worm. Anyway, I do have some worm flies. This is it. This is part of the deadly range. You know, you know we've got the killer range bunch of nymphs mainly uh, and, and some small bait fish flies and then we've got the deadly range and this is part of the deadly range and this is the deadly worm it's got a tungsten and bead on the front it's got a strong curved wire hook Japanese only the best and the material has got a bit of bling to it and it's got that sort of signature, and I've created signature hump there using the material, similar to what I've got in the, uh, the willow grub fly, my foam willow grub fly, the banana. You know, it's got that little signature hump, and I've got it in the, the blood worm as well, but this is to imitate the bigger worm, which is the earthworm within fish love worms. So I've got it tungsten bead, uh, and I've got it without a tungsten bead, like so. But when you cast this one, I advise just wet it, a bit of spit in it, 
so it sinks because a couple of times I've cast this and it's sat in the surface. The only time a fish has actually come up and taken it, but um, very effective flies. I've just been using some in the river here in Tasmania. There was a downpour of rain, the river came up and the fish were gobbling these. A bit of bling, the sparkle, the fish just see it shimmering in the water. Boom! Pretty deadly fly, hence the name, the deadly worm. Here you go. Thanks for watching. Go and get some worms. Worms. <laughs> Say yeah. Thanks for your support. The last time I was in Tasmania, I noticed, and this is decades ago, I noticed the trout were in the shallows chasing tadpoles. And they eat the frogs as well. But a few places I went, there was a lot of tadpoles. So I'm back there. This I'm back this time. And I've got this fly here that I designed called the Reed Taddy. I've had it for years, but I'm just showing you it because I keep quite quiet sometimes. Nobody knows what I've done or got for sale. So that's a wee taddy. And obviously it's in black and olive. And I've designed it so it rides that way up in the water. So if it sits in the bottom, you cast it out and it sits in the bottom, it sits with the hook point riding up. It's got dumbbell eyes, so it's slightly weighted. And it's slightly weighted because I've got an epoxy back on it. It's that shiny bit there, I don't know if you can see it. That helps flip it up. So that's how it rides. So if a fish comes along and you twitch it, it comes up in the water, fish grabs it. Or you cast it out and you just gently work it back mid-water column or just off the bottom. It's got a marabou tail, but when it's wet, it just twitches back and forth like the tail of a tadpole. It's got a round deer hair body and the hook gape is wide open. It's a great little fly. That was when I left Tasmania the first time I thought, I'm gonna design a tadpole fly. Probably took 16 years or something before I finished it and got onto it. So much happening. So I saw the tadpoles in the first time in uh, Tasmania and the trout chasing them. And then I was in India and I was at the bottom of the, the the Himalayas in a little village and there was a pond there and there was these massive tadpoles. I was taking photos of them and mucking around. There was no fish, but I just loves, I'm just geeky like that, you know. So I've got these big tadpoles and I'm watching them and I went, I've still got to design a tadpole fly. So I went back after that trip in India and I designed these tadpole flies. And then I sent them to a friend in Tasmania who tried them out for me with great success and so then I brought them out for sale and I call it the wee taddy got to have a bit of scottish in there wee taddy and years later I go back and I write this book about fishing in the Himalayas and the travel in India and I go to a lake over 14,000 feet up that's probably never been fished before and there's a tribute to the wee taddy I take this fly with me and I catch a fish on that lake. Years later I go back, I go to this remote lake, find it by accident and I catch a fish with a wee daddy. Got a camp chair so I'm off the ground and the ants can't get me. I'm going to tell you a little story of, of my fly shop and why it's called Stu's Fly Shop. Now you would think that's pretty obvious. Last thing I wanted to do was have the word stew in front of my little shop. Then I put it out to um, a fly fishing forum, a very big one. Some people started writing in um, a list of what it should be called. And some were just uh, everything for free and fly fishing and you know all this crap. And some of it were quite hilarious. But there was a few people that wrote in they were quite sensible sort of business people and they nearly all says call it Stu's Fly Shop and that's how it got the name Stu's Fly Shop. Watch out for it, you're going to love it. It's a New Zealand story and it's a full story about an obsession and a journey and an adventure to catch one single fish. Because in New Zealand... We know where the fish are. We know their names. We can see them. 
it's unlike the rest of the world. There's never been a book written about trout fly fishing like this, or trout fishing in general. So you got to look out for trout love. And you can tell I'm getting old and a little bit senile. I thought, why has it got the logo there? I think I've got it on backwards. <laughs> writing, ripping bits of paper up, and uh, working on the book, Wandering Trout. Uh, but I was just down in the city, and I decided I might try and get a bit more te high tech on this uh, video shit, or stuff, sorry, did I swear? And I couldn't resist this. I bought this tripod, pretty cool, eh? But the, the reason I bought it and actually seen it was because look at the name of it, Joby. And in Scotland where I'm from, a Joby, let me tell you, a Joby is a shite. So I had to buy it. Joby. Love it. Love it. What a name. So, okay, I've uh, done the man thing, and as you can see, I've removed the jobby from the box. <laughs> I love saying that. So the jobby's out the box, and this is what it looks like. It looks like a little, I don't know, a little alien or something. Seems pretty well made. Bit flash for me. I'm used to just using my hands and tins of spam and stuff. But anyway, so let's see. And uh, it comes with this little fella here. So yeah, there's two parts to this jobby. And they look well made. And inside here is the instructions. And just like most males, I'm leaving them in the box. Thanks for watching. Yeah, Joby. <laughs>